Good morning. Any questions for me before I begin? Yeah. Yeah, in the assignment, I think I asked you to, uh, it was my intention to ask you to do for two initial uh, conditions. And if you read the, sec the part of the question, I do say do the simulation for both parts. But I gave you only one of them, which is 0, 0, 0. Okay, this is for the ordinary differential equation, initial value type. Now, if you notice that 0, 0, 0 is a trivial solution, it satisfies it. And so when you plot any of the variables, like y1 versus time, if this is 0, you just get a straight line like this. What do you, 4, 5, 6, nothing changes. The derivatives are 0, that, that's a steady state solution. But I also want you to do it for 1, 0, 0. Okay? Then only you will get these strange behavior. Okay, so please do for both both the initial conditions for the particular problem. Okay. Uh, I haven't looked at the midterm exam. Uh, if you have any feedback, I would like to hear. <coughs> I'm going to be traveling again this afternoon. I'm leaving for Edmonton, and I'll be back on Monday. So I'll be back on a Tuesday uh, Tuesday class next week. But I don't think I'll have the time to grade the uh, midterm exam even by Tuesday. So I will promise to get it to you by next Thursday. And uh, as soon as I mark it, of course, I will up update the status on the model. Okay, But I don't intend on taking the marking with me to there because I have other meetings there. Uh, so I apologize for the delay, but uh, how, how did the exam go? Fair, reasonable. Okay, uh, that's because I kind of prepared you for it, right? Through the quizzes and the assignments, I kind of prepared you for that. And I will gradually escalate because I want to see how many of you are able to first understand what we have done and ask question, answer questions on variations of the things that we have done. And that's what the first midterm exam is about. The second midterm exam, I will push a little bit further in the sense, I'll give you a new problem that you have never seen and see how at least one of the four or five problems there and see how many of you can think on your own to uh, answer questions. The, the, that, that's basically the test of whether you are able to understand the basic concepts and apply it in any situation, not only the situations that we have seen in the class or slight variations of those. Okay, So I'm kind of cautioning you right now, you should be kind of thinking about it. And the best way to prepare for something like this, it's not going to be completely, I'm not going to ask you a question from astrophysics. It's going to be from chemical engineering and it is going to be from one of the problems in the textbook, okay, that I have put on more. So I would encourage you to kind of read more on your own on those uh, kind of uh, problems. So if, are there any questions? Yeah. I, I thought that was a failure in the sense that only four or five people showed showed up. Maybe those four or five found it useful, um, but uh, I'm willing to experiment. If you think that you will need it, I'm willing to experiment. Uh, this Saturday, of course, I won't be there, um, but uh, we can resume it next Saturday. Do you want something like that to continue or? Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, I can do that, yeah. How many of you are in this situation? How many would welcome that? <laughs> yeah. Okay, enough hands are going up. I don't have any problem with that. Uh, when do you want to risk this? Thursday, Thursday, Thursday. Next Thursday? Uh, that's fine. Okay, I can live with that. So next Thursday, yeah. But next Tuesday, we will have class. I'll be back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Yeah. Saturday, I cannot, but uh, I'll be back Monday night. So, uh, would evening hours work? Tuesday evening, I could set it up between 7 and 9 or something like that. The same virtual lab idea, right? Yeah. We'll come for, yeah. PM. 
Okay. <coughs> Okay, so uh, there are no questions. Uh, what what we are going to do is turn a new chapter in this course. So far, we have seen how to build models, how to identify, classify the models, so that we pick the right tool in MATLAB for solving such problems. And that already is a very powerful thing that we have learned in this course. If you feel comfortable that you have understood it, then it's a lot of achievement because we can solve any linear system of algebraic equations, you know the tools. You can solve a system of nonlinear algebraic equations, a system of ordinary differential equations of the initial value type and boundary value type. You are not going to see anything beyond that in the entire undergraduate chemical engineering curriculum. Okay? Partial differential equations are the next step, but when you go to graduate school, you will be forced to deal with that. But this already gives you a powerful tool for understanding where the model comes from, what it is about. What you will learn in the other courses is details about heat exchanger design, details about distillation column, separation process, absorption columns. So there are a lot of issues that you need to, as a process engineer, develop your skills. But the basic mathematical and computational skills, you know how to solve these problems. If you encounter a problem like that in any course, you should know, okay, I can always go to MATLAB and set it up. The other solution would be I can always go to Aspen or ISIS and solve it even without writing the script or the MATLAB function files. And I will introduce you to Aspen or ISIS. How many of you have seen or used Aspen or ISIS? Nobody. Okay. So I think we should spend some time introducing those because those are powerful design tools that are built on all the things that we are seeing in this course. Okay. So that you have an appreciation of how they are put together and how easy it is to use that or abuse it. So we should know both of them. Okay. So what we are going to do now in this course is how does the answer the question of how does MATLAB do its job? How does MATLAB invert a matrix? How does MATLAB solve a system of nonlinear algebraic equations? What are the ideas? What are the algorithms? Can I develop something similar to it? What are the difficulties? What are the challenges in doing that? Why is F solve so powerful? Can I write F solve by myself? So issues like that we are going to explore. So this is the numerical ways of solving the mathematical model that we have developed. So the rest of the course is going to be about looking at these ideas of uh, how Aspen and Heises work, how, how, how do they implement those, how does MATLAB do it, solving a variety of problems. So the problem, the first problem that we are going to take that we already talked about in the last class is given a function f of x equal to 0, how do I find this value of x where that function is equal to 0? In a one-dimensional case, conceptually, it is very easy to understand. All I need to do is plot that function f of x as a function of x and see where that function intersects the x-axis. That is my solution. Those are the few values of x where that function is equal to 0. That is what we mean by solve nonlinear equation. We talked about in the last class, how do we generalize that to multidimensional case? Mathematically, it's very easy. I just have to write two equations into unknowns. And if I can do program that in F-Sol, F-Sol can solve that using the same ideas that we are going to see for one equation in one unknown. But geometrically representing it like what I've done here is going to be much more challenging because two equations in two unknowns, already we saw that we need to think of mountains and intersection of mountains, etc. Three equations in three unknowns is even more difficult. Okay. So question we are going to answer is how do we develop an algorithm to solve such problems? Okay. That's what uh, I have identified here. How, how does have solved, do it. The, if you are given this problem, and this function can be any complicated function that comes from distillation or absorption, pipeline flow problem, okay. So I don't want to be able to graph this function every time to see where the solution is. So how would I do intuitively without knowing anything about it? You are the first person addressing this problem on this planet Earth. Somebody developed these algorithms before. So go through the thought process. How would they have done it? Or how would you do it if you didn't know anything about it? Okay. The obvious way would be, well, I have a way of calculating this function. So if I make a guess for x, geometrically it means this, I make a guess for x, I can calculate the f and check. Is this f0? No, throw away that. Okay. Then you make a second guess. Is that function 0? No, throw away that. You can do this forever. 
right? So what you want to do is, this is the hit and miss strategy. Guess and then try to come up with a better guess and a better guess towards solving the particular problem. So the very first step is make a guess for the solution. That would be something like this and calculate what the function is. The next step of the algorithm, algorithm is a procedure, a recipe, okay? The next step of the algorithm is devise a scheme to improve that guess because we don't want to be blindly guessing it then because we will never know when we will reach towards the end. So we want a strategy. This is where the intelligence in FSOL and all the other algorithms that we are going to see comes. How can we devise a scheme that will give me a better guess the next time, okay? And once I find that, I have a mechanism for generating a sequence of guesses from the previous guess that hopefully will take me towards that solution. And the third step would be uh, check if the improved guess satisfies the solution criterion. What is the solution criterion? f equal to zero. So check whether f is equal to zero. If f is equal to zero, you stop guessing. If not, you continue the guess. That means you put a loop. You can imagine these algorithms were developed long before computers were there in the 1920s and the Newton method was in fact done by Newton, okay, so a long time ago. And how would they do it? They would do it by paper. So they would calculate the function, plug in and do the loop by hand, okay. Now you can easily program it and let the computers do the repetitive task. So that is what we would call an algorithm. An algorithm is a sequence of steps that we have figured out that will get us to where we want to go. Okay, any questions on that? So what do you need to understand? There are three stages. First, make a guess. It would be nice if we can make that guess itself in an intelligent way, but often we cannot because we don't know where the solution is. Okay? And then devise a scheme for improving it in a successive way, in a repetitive way, and check every time you have improved whether you have reached close enough to the solution. Okay, And then you would stop. That would be the stopping criteria. Any questions on that? Okay, so the first algorithm that we are going to see is called the bisection algorithm. What is the idea behind this bisection algorithm? Pictorial, graphically. Okay, so this algorithm, this procedure requires you to make two guesses. The first guess, x1, and the second guess, x2. So you need to give this algorithm two inputs, two values of x. Ideally, it would be nice if these guesses x1, x2 are <coughs> on either side of a desired root. The desired root here is in this place where f of, f of x equal to 0. Okay? So you need to make these two guesses. Often that's not possible. So f sub has intelligence to know that you don't really need to give me anything. You give me any guess, I will try a certain number of times and I will give up. Okay? So that's another thing that you need to look at because you're going to check and if you never reach that target, you've tried a million times, Maybe you have such a poor guess or a, such a poorly formulated problem that there is no solution to that problem. Can you have such, such a situation when there is no solution? Of course you can. Suppose the function does something like this. It never crosses the x-axis, okay? And you don't know that, so you give an initial guess and then FSOL keeps searching and searching and searching and then it gives up. So that's where it puts an error message saying, I could not get the function to zero, okay? A warning message or an error message. Okay. So in the bisection method, the idea is very simple. You give me two values of x1 and x2. They should be such that I, when I calculate f1 and f2 and take their product, their product should be negative. What does that mean? One is below, the other one is above. It doesn't matter which one is below, which one is above. As long as they are on either side of the real root, f1 will be negative, f2 will be positive, or f1 will be positive, f2 will be negative, okay? So you need to check the product of f1 times f2 and see whether it is negative. If it is negative, you have a good guess. If not, you throw out and say, give me two other guesses to the user, okay? So FSOL doesn't require you to do that, but bisection algorithm will require you two guesses. Not only that, these two guesses must be on either side of a root where the problem might find a solution. The next step is, so we have a good guess. The next step is we need to find a better guess. What would be a better guess? An obvious choice for a better guess would be somewhere in between, right? Because you know now you have bracketed it. So you know somewhere in between. So I'm going to say it's exactly halfway between. That's why it's called a bisection method. It bisects 
that distance x1 minus uh, x2 minus x1 in this case and says x3 is going to be equal to x1 plus x2 over 2. That is your update algorithm. So the update schema is the new guess you're going to make is x3 is simply x1 plus x2 divided by 2. Okay. N then what do you do? You calculate f3 at that point because you can always calculate the function because you've written a function. So you put in a value of x, it's going to return the value of f. Right? So take that x3 and make a call to that function and that function returns f3. Okay, now you have f1, f2, f3. What do you do next? What is the next decision you need to make? You need to decide which of these three values are you're going to, which of the two values of those three that you're going to keep and which one you're going to throw out. So the two values that you keep must narrow the bracket, must go towards that. Okay, so in this particular case, in the figure, what would you keep? x1 and x3, right? Why? Because f1 times f3 is negative. So that is the criterion that you would check. Is the product of the two functions. If f1 times f3 is negative, then keep x3 and discard x2. How would you implement that in, in a MATLAB program? That's very simple. All you have to do is x2 is equal to x3 and f2 is equal to f3. So what it does is it takes the values of x3 and f3 and loads it into x2 and f2. And x3 and f3 will still contain the same values, but we don't care. We can forget about that. So I have a new value for x1 and x2. Okay. So this becomes, this becomes x2, that becomes f2. All I have to do is go back and calculate a new I'm seeing whether your thought process is projecting where I'm stopping. New x3, right? Because now you are at the same starting point as before. You calculated a new value and you decided that these two are the values that are on the opposite side of the root. So you're going to keep that. And then you're going to go back and say, okay, my next x3 is going to be halfway between these two. So all I need to do is close the loop. And so I calculate a new x3 and I discard always the ones that is irrelevant and keep the two new ones. Always check that they are bracketing it. Okay. And of course, somewhere before I go to calculate x3 again and again and again, I need to check also whether f3 has become small enough. If f3 has become small enough, then I stop the procedure. Any questions on the bisection algorithm? Conceptually, you understood what needs to be done, right? Now we need to go and implement it in MATLAB. Yeah. What if the function went up and barely touched the exact thing Very good. I was going to ask all these variations later on, but you jumped on it. So the question is, what if the function does this? Right? What do you think? This algorithm is not good for it. This algorithm will never find such a root. Okay. So we need to have so once we understand the basic idea of what our algorithm works and what we can ask, what are the defects in this? And then we can say, okay, I'm going to try to improve on it, fix on the defective part of the algorithm and improve. So we will see a series of algorithms that are, each one is better than the previous one. This is the most naive one I can think of. And then we're going to improve that to overcome problems like these, because this algorithm is not going to detect a minimum. Okay. But that would be a very rare exception when you have a double root. You would call this as a double root. Why, why, why did we call it as a double root? Do you remember? These are concepts you should be able to do in a, a second midterm exam. What is a double root? What is a triple root? And will this algorithm work on a double root? What is a double root? Do you remember? Exactly. It occurs with multiplicity of 2. So if r is this, then it occurs as x minus r squared. If we have other factors in there equal to 0, but that root appears with a uh, uh, multiplicity of two. Okay, excellent question. So that is the idea. So x3 is equal to x1 plus x2 over two. That is the update method to update the new guess and then check. Here is the check. If f1 times f3 is less than zero, then x3 goes to x2 and f3 goes to f2 else x3 goes to x1, else x3 goes to x1. So it's really nice construct for if then else uh, uh, implementation. And then check for convergence. The absolute value of f3 must be less than 
some epsilon. Epsilon is a tolerance, the criterion that you say. I want the function. You can never get zero. You can never get the function to be zero because you are doing it in a computer. So you can get it to be ten, four decimal places or ten decimal places, etc. So we're going to now write this function, and I'm going to go through this slowly only for this function, and then for all the other algorithms, including this algorithm, I'll give you uh, the actual function that is more general than what we are going to do. Okay, and they are all in the book, so you should be familiar with. If I put an error there, how to fix it? Does this algorithm implement this? Does this function implement that algorithm correctly? Those kind of questions. But let's just start with MATLAB. Okay, so I'm going to create a new function called test by set. Okay. Remember, keep all the ideas in your mind and you need to help me write this program. You need to implement all the things that we have talked about. Okay. So the first line would be function r is equal to bisect fun comma x. So, um, good question. So test bisect. Do I have to have that? That is what I call my file. My file is named as test underscore bisect dot m. But you observed immediately I was not calling the function the same name. It is good. It's a good practice to call it with the same name, but you don't have to. If you just leave it as bisect, it will still work. But, but when you are calling this function from the MATLAB command window, if you just type bisect, it won't know. It always searches by the file name. Okay, so you should to call this function to execute this function, you have to call it as test bisect. So to be consistent, let's call the function name also as test bisect. Now the function name would become important if you are having sub functions within the same file, because the sub functions are not known outside of the file structure. So these are some of the more intricate features of the MATLAB. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so what have I done here? I have defined my function scope of the function. It's going to have two inputs. Okay. And the name of the function is test underscore bisect, and it is going to return one value. What do you think that one value will be? Is it x3? This remember, this function is going to give me the solution to that problem f of x equal to 0. It's going to apply this many, many times, and I have to write another function. So this is like equivalent to fsol. I am writing a function that fsol, whatever fsol does, this function should do the same thing. That is, take the name of a function file that you are solving the problem, give it an initial guess, and then go through its uh, gymnastics and give you the final converged result, the root. So R here is, what it returns is going to be the root of the function f of x equal to 0. What would the first input be, f u n? Function name, the name of the function of the problem that you are going to solve. So there are two parts to it. FSOL is an algorithm that solves any nonlinear function. So the nonlinear function is something that you write based on the problem you want to solve. But FSOL uses a procedure to solve that. So in the same way, bisect is a procedure that we are writing, an algorithm that we are writing that will solve any function, any problem. So the fun is the name of that function. So you begin to see the internal structures of how FSOL will be. If you lift FSOL, it will be probably 1,000 lines. It's a huge program because it has a lot of intelligence in it. Uh, we can write the same functionality in maybe 10 lines, but of course ours will miserably fail in a lot of situations, and that's why we need to use fsol, but we need to understand what fsol does. Okay? So fun is going to be the name of a function, and what do you think x would be? Initial guesses. Okay? What should be the length of that vector x? At least two, because bisection method requires you to get two inputs. Okay? So you can put some comments here saying fun is the name of the function uh, being solved. And yes. Okay, and uh, x is the guess it must be at least two. You can put any helpful information for anybody that is going to use this. Okay, So you are just identifying what the input and the output are typically. 
we can say r is the root of the function, something like this. Now help me. We get, we've gotten started with the function. What should be the next step? Keep the picture in, in mind. And what did we do in the picture? And that's the same thing that you need to do. So I have two guesses, x1 and x2, okay, that come into this function through the input argument. So once I have x1 and x2, what did I do in this algorithm when I was discussing it conceptually? I calculated f1 and f2. I need to calculate the two function values, okay. So if you give me x1, I need to find out what f1 is. If you give me x2, and I need to find what f2 is, so that I can check whether the product of f1 and f2 is negative. That way I know I have a root in between. So the first thing I have to do here is calculate that function. So I'm going to say this is a new function that we are going to see. It's called FEVAL. It's a built-in function. Its purpose is to pass control to whatever the external function is. That is function evaluation. FEVAL. Evaluate. Evaluate this function. Okay. And the syntax of this is simply F comma X. Very simple. But this is the first time we are seeing this, so it's important that you understand what this function does. <coughs> FEVAL is a function, just like sine is a function, EXP is a function, built-in functions. Length is a function, drank is a function. MATLAB has thousands of these functions. But the, the FEVAL is often used, and the purpose of FEVAL is transfer control. At that stage, it knows the name of the function FUM. Okay, how, how does it know? We are going to tell it solve this particular problem, okay? So it knows what is the name of the function and it knows the values of x, x1 and x2. So it transfers the control and says, you do whatever the problem is, calculate those two function values and turn it to me. And I will store it in f, okay? So that's the very first step. So when you executed this, you will have f1 and f2, okay? And let's do it naively and then make mistakes and then try to fix it as we go along, okay? So the next thing that we saw is we need to calculate x3, okay? You want to do that now? Let's do that. Okay, if you want to do that, let's do that. So that we need to make sure that the, the two guesses are in between the root. So how would you make that? If product of f1 times f2 is less than or we can say greater than 0, what happens if it is greater than 0? If it is not less than 0, we really can't do anything. We cannot go further, right? So you just check then, is it greater than 0? If it is greater than 0, we say, uh, you can put an error message. Error, uh, no roots, end. So what this will do is check whether the product of f1, f2 is greater than 0. And if it is greater than 0, it will just error is another built-in function. And it takes the control out of it. Once it hits the function error, it doesn't continue to execute whatever you put in between, below that. So it just prints that message, no roots, and then gets out. Okay, and we, we will test these ideas. Okay. Now, uh, you asked a question about what would happen if it patches this, okay, you can ask the same question, what happens if it is like this, where there are two roots, and my, unfortunately, my two initial guesses turn out to be somewhere here and here. What would this method do? Even though there are two roots, this method will kick it out and say, no roots, because there is no sign change. We are using the sign change to detect that there is a root in between, okay? That's a failure of this uh, particular algorithm. Next, what I need to do is, I need to, if I get past this step, now I know that I have two guesses that are reasonable, right? If it is not greater than zero, it means it must be less than or equal to zero, I guess, okay? So let's just look at greater than and less than, not, not, not complicated too much. So the next thing I need to do is calculate x3. x3 is equal to x1 plus x2 divided by 2. Now, you can implement this in many ways. For example, I could have said x3 
is equal to sum of x divided by 2. It would have produced the same thing. What am I doing now? I'm using the built-in function sum, which actually takes a vector of any length and sums the elements in there. Okay. So whatever fashion that you want to do, uh, the idea is that you need to be able to calculate x3. Okay. Now what do I do? After I did x3, what did I do here? I calculated f3. Okay. So I need to do implement that. Okay. If I'm going too slow, let me know. Okay. Uh, I can switch to showing the function. So f3 is equal to what would I do? Exactly. F eval form comma x3. Okay, so now I have f3. So what should I do next? Well, what did I do in the algorithm? I checked if the product of f1 times f3 is less than 0, then I decide to keep x3. If not, I decide to keep uh, x3 in x1, otherwise I keep, decide to keep x3 in x2. Okay, So it's this line that I need to implement. Check that the two most recent values are still bracketing the root. That idea I need to implement. How would I implement that? If f1 times f3 is less than 0, then I want to take x3 and put it into x1. Take x3 and put it into x2. Okay, So I say x2 is equal to x3 and f2 is equal to f3. Else, that means if that condition is not satisfied, then I say take uh, x3 and put it into x1. x1 is equal to x3 and f1 is equal to f3. And so that logic will make sure that I am always keeping the two values that are on either side of the root, except I am going to narrow down that bracket gradually to very close to each other. Okay. What, what, what do I need to do next? Check for convergence. That means I need to check the absolute value of x3 is small, small. Yeah. Does it matter that you're making x3 array and x1 as 2? That's a good question. That's a very good question, a good observation. Remember, MATLAB is dynamically able to change the array size. So when the function comes, control comes into this function, x will have only two values. It will be an array containing only x1 and x2. But I can automatically put x3, then the array dimension will be increased to x3. But I will have three values and some numbers will be stored in each one of them. And what I want to make sure is, in the first two, I have the most relevant one. On the third, I have the most recent and I will check and discard it. Okay. <clears throat> so it is perfectly okay in line 12 to say x3 is equal to x1 plus x2 because if x3 didn't exist before, but I'm creating it. And in most programs like uh, C and Fortran, that will give you a problem because you haven't declared the size before. But in MATLAB, it dynamically increases the array size. There are a lot of nice fine features like this that you will learn the more you use MATLAB and asking these kind of questions and thinking about them. Okay? Any other question? So the next step would be that I need to check if abs, abs is a built-in function. It takes the absolute value of f3 is less than, what should it be less than? Some epsilon, some number. So you can put in a very naive way for the first time, I'm going to say just 0 0.00001. That means make sure that the function is small enough, close enough. For engineering purposes, we are okay if we get an answer to two decimal places. We don't need 20 decimal places, right? So, but it's something that you can control. And uh, FSOL allows you to control this parameter up to about 16 digits. So you can ask up to 16 significant digits, okay? And what I need to do is, if that is true, what do I want to do? If the absolute value of F3 is less than this, what do I want to do? I'm done. I'm done with the job, right? 
you can print x3 or you can return x3 right to whatever the function is that is calling so a good statement here to put would be r is equal to x3 and then say return end okay so if it hits that path if this condition is ever satisfied this will put the value of x3 into r and that r is the one that is going to be returned it's an output from this function and this return con 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 command simply exists from this function even if you have other things below it will just exit at that point because it has done the job if it hasn't done the job you may want to print some error messages below and i will show you a more fancy version of the same function right now all we are doing is capturing the essential ideas and implementing it in in matlab any question if there is no question i have a question for you do you think we are done will it work exactly I'm very glad that you picked it up. The whole thing is going to go through only once. You make a call, you send a value of x, it goes through all the logic, but it does it only once. So it will probably, unless you are extremely lucky in giving a good initial guess, it will never get to this, but it will just get out because there's nothing else to execute at the end. So what do you need to do? You need to put a loop. We talked about repeating the step where we calculate x3 often. So where would that loop start and where would that loop end? Uh, do you want to put it there? That's just an initial check. When somebody sends you the two values, you want to check whether it is right regime. But after that, once you've gotten that, you are always going to keep the two values that are bracketing. So you can put a loop, it's not going to create any problem, but you don't need to put the loop there because that is always will be satisfied. So the best place to put the loop would be in fact here. For what kind of loop should I put? Okay, let me start it off with a for. Can I use a while loop? You could use a while loop. Okay, the while loop will say while f3 is greater than a certain number, keep doing it. And will quit when that number goes below that. The only problem with this is you will set up an infinite loop potentially because it may never go below 10 to the minus 6, right? Yes. There is a potential for an infinite loop. So use of while in those circumstances is not a good idea. That's why even FSOL with all its intelligence in the algorithm will do the calculations only a finite number of times and then give up with a warning message. So I need to put the for loop for i equals 1 to 100 maybe. What I'm saying is do it 100 times and then give up. Okay. So do what? Do, th do this. Calculate x3, calculate f3, check if they are bracketing it, check if the function is satisfying it and then put an end for the for loop. Okay. Now the algorithm is complete. So we have seen conceptually what the algorithm is. We have learned how to implement it in MATLAB. We need to now test it. How would you test it? So we will save it. You need to write a some test problem. You could take your parallel pipeline problem that you're doing. Instead of running it with FSOL, you could run it with this. The only thing is this one will solve only one equation in one unknown. Same thing as F0, which also solves only one equation in one unknown. FSOL is much more powerful. You can solve any number of equations in an equal number of unknowns. Okay. So I need to write a function that will I, that I would want to use to test it. So I'm going to try, write a new function. Well, okay, I didn't know that it does that. Um, output arguments. I just want the function values to be returned and the input one is test. This is a test function and it's going to take x as the input. Okay, and I'm going to save it in a file called test.m. I guess it already does that. Okay. Am I in the right place? Yes, I'm not. Okay, let me just make sure that I'm in the right path. That's an error that uh, there. Okay, I want to save it there. Right. Okay. So I'm going to make up a function. The function that I'm going to make up is um, 
let me just write it down here for you. The reason I am making up this function is I want it to be simple so that I know where the roots are because I am just testing whether the algorithm is working. So let us take an example of f of x as equal to x minus 1 times x minus 2 equal to 0. Why do I do that? Because I know exactly where the roots are. So if I multiply this out, x square minus 3x plus 2 equal to 0. Okay, This is going to be my test function. And I want to see whether I can pick up these roots 1 and 2 from that algorithm. So how would I write that function in here? Just one line. What would that be? Keep that in mind. x square minus 3x plus 2. So f should be equal to x square minus 3x plus 2. That's all I need. Now, will this function work for a vector of values of x? I put 10 values of x, will it give me 10 function values? What would be the difference if I take this dot? If I take the dot out, if this is again a subtle point in MATLAB, that function will work if I pass one value to x and it will return one function. But if I put the dot, it becomes much more powerful. I can send it 10 values and it will return the 10 function values. Now, the bisect algorithm, I, mean, I know, will send at least two values. So it should be able to send two function values. And that's why I need to have the dot here. Does it make sense? Okay. So let me save the test bisect also in the same path. Oops. Ah. Give me a minute. <laughs> I should have been better prepared. I'm sorry. Okay. So I have both the functions. I've written two functions. One is a bisection algorithm, the other one is a test function. They are both in the same directory. Okay. And uh, I can type them, for example, test. There is a test function. I can test it out by saying test from 0 0.1 to 3. So what will it return? It will return a lot of function values and let, let me store them as y is equal to. Okay, And then I can plot, for example, uh, 0 0.1 to 3 comma y. So that is the function I have built and it has two roots. You can see the function is equal to 0 at x equal to 1 and at x equal to 2. Okay, So this is a simple example so I want to control everything to test whether my algorithm works. Okay, so I have a test function and I have an algorithm. How do I call the algorithm? I call the algorithm by saying, uh, typing the name of the bisect. Now you help me. What should I pass it to? Test is the name of the function with an ampersand sign. That's how it knows it's a name of a function. The ampersand sign says that it's a name of a function. And then I'm going to put two guesses. They're going to be 0.5 and 1.5. So what should I get as an output? I should get one. There it is. The answer is one. Okay, the root. But you did print out a lot of the function values. That probably because I have forgotten some semicolon somewhere to suppress. Where did I miss that? Okay, we will figure it out. Okay, what I want to do now, are there any questions? Are you following what we have done so far? Okay, we have implemented a new algorithm called bisect and we have tested it on a test problem. I want to show you how the flow through occurs between the various functions. So I'm going to set up a breakpoint here. Okay, and I'm going to make the same call 
and also trace the issue of where the functions are being printed out. Not everywhere, I think only one place. Okay. So I'm going to execute the same function with the same guess. Okay. So what is going to happen at this stage is from the command line, the control goes to test by set, that function that I have written with two parameters. One is the function name test, the other one is two guesses. So for example, if I now look at what this variable fun contains, it contains at test. So that is the name of the function. And what does x contain? The two guesses I have put. Okay. So at this stage, if I execute at line 6, what would happen? The control goes from here to FEVAL and FEVAL passes it to test. Okay, And test takes these two numbers and will return two function values. So all this has happened. Okay, The control has gone to FEVAL, from FEVAL it has jumped to test and it, the test has calculated those two numbers and returned to FEVAL and FEVAL has returned it to me as F. Okay. Okay, now I'm going to test whether f1 times f2 is greater than 0. Tell me which, um, which path will it take or which line will it go to next when I hit execute? Will it go to line 9? I'm right now in line 8. Will it go to 10? Will it go to 11? Any guesses? I want to make sure that you're following what is happening here. When I hit execute the next line, line uh, 8, what is it going to do? It's going to test whether f1 times f2 is greater than 0. You can already check. f1 is 0.75, f2 is minus 0.25. The product is going to be negative. That means it cannot go to line 9. It goes to 11, uh, line 11. There it is going to set up a loop to do it 100 times. Okay. <coughs> so it calculates x3, it calculates f3. And here is another test for you. Where will it go? Where will the path follow now? Remember, we are testing f1 times f3. Oh, here we have a problem. <laughs> Why did f3 become 0? We, we hit a very unique situation. I want to know whether you can catch it. What happened? My guesses were 0. 0.5 and 1.5. What is the average of those? And what is one? One is a root, right? You will never hit that lucky guesses uh, often, okay? You need to go through many guesses. But in this case, because we made up the problem, it turns out that F3 is, uh, so it is not less than zero, okay? So it is equal to zero in this case. And it goes through that and it checks whether the function is less than that. What do you think would happen? It is 0, so it is less than 0 0.001, right? So it's going to quit after right after one iteration and return the value of x3 into r and get out of the function, okay? So you understand, and this you should be able to do. You are debugging a program, the ability to trace where the flow, where the logic is flowing, and whether you have a problem in your logic will allow, allow you to uh, test those things, okay? Any questions? Okay, let's do a few tests. So this is 0.5 and 1.5. If I do 1.4, what is going to happen? Oops, I should take this out. And continue that. Okay, so it gives me that rule. So if I do between 1.5 and 2.4, what do I get? I get 2. Okay. So depending on where the roots are, if you bracket it, the bisection method will always take you there. Okay. Any questions? Now, if I do this, what do you think would happen? Zero and three. There should be two roots. But it says no roots. Why? Because it found both f1 and f2 to be positive. Even though there are two roots, this, me this method fails. Okay? If you are using bisection scheme, you need to make a good guess. Okay? FSOL is more tolerant in that. It will allow you to make wild guesses and still try to get you the solution. 
So there is a whole idea of algorithms are how to generate a good initial guess from whatever you throw at it. Okay. Now let me show you the actual bisection algorithm that is in your textbook that I wrote with lots more bells and whistles in there and try to understand what we are trying to do here. So here I'm passing up to four parameters fun comma x comma tall comma trace. What are the roles of each one of them? And I ex briefly explained. Tall is the error criterion. So you can specify, do it for four significant digits or 14 significant digits as the third parameter in your calling sequence. And the fourth parameter in your calling sequence is give me output as you are iterating it. And FSOL also has this feature. Okay. You can set up one of the parameters so that as it is iterating, it will tell you what is the current x value, what is the current f value. You can monitor whether it is going towards the root or not. Okay. And how do you use it? By set name of the function and the two initial guesses. <coughs> okay. So I want to introduce to you a few additional features in MATLAB. So the first significant statement in this function, this is a uh, same algorithm. Okay, but with the additional bells and whistles. So if n a r g a n is less than four, comma trace equal to zero n. <coughs> now I have to tell you what n a r g a n does. Okay, it's called. <coughs> it's a built-in variable. MATLAB has a number of built-in variables. EPS is one of them. Epsilon. Okay, that tells you what the machine precision is. For example, if you type pi, oops, this is. That's a built-in variable. You cannot use pi for anything else. It's a built-in variable that represents pi. Similarly, EPS is a built-in variable. So the number of built-in variables like this in MATLAB and NARGIN is one such, but it doesn't exist. <coughs> I'm wrong. <laughs> I guess it exists with a certain number. It's a very large number. Okay, but it's a built-in variable. It's a built-in variable, just like built-in functions. But its value will change dynamically, automatically, once you are within a function. And at this stage, it, it will have a value which simply counts how many arguments you have passed in. So it stands for n argument, number of arguments in. N-A-R-G-I-N, number of arguments that is coming in. Similarly, there is something called N-A-R-G out. Okay? So here, this number will be either 4 or 3 or 2 or 1, depending on how many values comma separated values that you have passed when you are calling this function. Okay, So if it is less than 4, that means you have passed, uh, you have chosen to ignore the last value. So it automatically resets to a default value trace equal to 0, which means don't print me out all the input. This is how FSO also handles the extra additional parameters. Okay, To show you that only I'm putting this uh, uh, particular function. Then if number of argument is less than 3, that means 2, you have not given both the tolerance and the trace. So it sets the tolerance to machine precision, which is EPS, and it turns trace off, meaning don't print it out. Okay, And then it checks if the length of x is not equal to 2. You have not given two guesses. So it prints out a message, please provide two guesses, and then quits Okay, from the error statement. So these are the built-in interaction that MATLAB will normally provide you with any functions that they have to have some checks on the input and then some default values that are set up and then you will see that everything else is the same. F is equal to F eval. We are calling F eval to evaluate the two function values. Here I have done this slightly differently. What have I done in line 18? <coughs> the sine function, what do you think it will do? The sine function will return plus 1 or minus 1. So if you have, for example, <coughs> uh, sine of minus 3, it ignores the minus, it ignores the 3, it just knows that it is minus, it's negative. So it will return minus 1. <coughs> if you put plus 3, it will return plus 1. So I'm just checking the sine of those two functions, the values. So pass f to sine, pick up the signs, take the product of those two, product takes the product of those two vectors, and check whether it is greater than 0. If it is greater than 0, print out no roots. Okay. And then I set up a loop for i equals 1 to 100. These are exactly the same as we before. These are the core of the algorithms. Everything else is, as I said, bells and whistles that allow the interaction to be easy. Okay. So x3, f3, then check whether it is bracketing it and keep the correct values. The absolute value of f3 is less than tolerance. 
put x ray into return uh, into r and return and trace this is the one that is additional one if trace is true that the trace is one for example print f print f all these numbers these are i for example is the iteration counter how many times you have tried it each time what is the value of x3 and what is the value of f3 and if it still doesn't converge there is an error message saying exceeded maximum number of iterations and quits so there is some interaction between this and uh, the matlab uh, <coughs> Uh, window. So the way I would use that function oh, before. Are there any questions on that? Do you have? Yeah. Is trace something you define? Trace is just a variable that I define, and it can have a value any any value. But in the logical variable, if it is true, that means it is one. If it is zero, it is false. So if trace is true, then print that. If trace is false, then don't print that. I will show you how we will use that, and then you will probably understand. It's just a variable name that I have created. It is not a built-in MATLAB function variable. What do the you mean by if it's true? Hmm? What do you mean by if it's true? Like <coughs> ah, what do I mean by if it is true? True or false in MATLAB is any variable will be in a logical context will be treated as true if it is one. If it is false, it will be zero. Okay. So I can set up variable, for example, x is equal to one. Okay, and then ask. Uh, <coughs> is true. I think there is a command like that. <laughs> I guess I guess it's not. Um, <coughs> you can check whether a particular variable is true or not. Let me just try this. If x uh, display uh, test. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to check if x is a true or a false variable. If it is true, then it should execute that command, display equals uh, test. If not, it should not display that. Okay, uh, I guess I have. Okay. Hmm. Display is command, right? Oh, test is a built-in function. I shouldn't use that. Okay. Display. Yeah, this test displays that. So if x is true, x has a value of 1 right now. So the, the, the meaning of this sentence would be if x is true, I can just do this. Then uh, display. No, oh, let me just put something else. End. Doesn't like reserved word. Oh, end. Okay. Come on. There. So if display is true, if x was set as 1, so it is true, so it displays that. If I set x is equal to 0, it will be treated as a uh, false. So if I execute the same statement, it won't print anything. Okay. So any variable can be treated as a logical variable depending on its value of 0 or 1. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do in that last uh, statement. If trace is true, then execute that command, which is printer. Okay? And if it's greater than 1, it's not any <coughs> that's, a, that's a good question. So uh, anything other than 0, I think, is treated as true. If it is 0, it's false. But anything other than uh, 0 is treated as true. I think so. In MATLAB, you need to always check these things out. Okay? So how would I use that bisect function, for example? That is the name of the function. That's the name of the file. And I'm going to use the same test function. And point 0.3, comma 1.5, something like this. Okay, so <coughs> it found the same value, but using the bisect function. Now I'm going to pass a third argument. The third argument says how accurate I want. For example, I want point 0.000001. It's going to find the result f going down to 10 to the minus 8. Okay? Now, if I put the fourth argument 1, now trace will be 1. And see what happens here. <coughs> Why did it not do? Or did it print? Yeah, it, see it printed iteration number 16. What is the function value? What is the x value? Iteration number 17. What is the function value and what is the 
but it is printing some the f value in between so i need to find and suppress that then you will clearly see yeah here put a semicolon okay so save that <coughs> It's printing the function, the x value, x3 and f3. This is x3 and this is f3 with every iteration. But I still need to suppress that. What am I not getting? You didn't put a warning for the one called the constant. Where? Go back to the other command window. Command window. There's no comma one. Ah, thank you. <laughs> there it is. Okay. <clears throat> so that is what trace does. Okay, but it's something that I designed. So you can design your own features. So the trace, if it is on, if it is one, if it is logical, then it says print out every time you calculate x3 and f3. So the first time, this was x3 and this was f3, far away from zero. The next iteration, this was x3 and this was f3. So by looking at this, I can see that the function values are decreasing. So that is what I would call converging. The algorithm is converging to the root. <coughs> and here you notice it has become zero. But why is it continuing? Because I specified the function to be up to six or seven decimal places. So it has become zero to about four or five decimal places. But still it hasn't met the criteria. Okay? So it prints out only five places, but it is still doing the work. So after 20 iterations, it finishes the job. So for example, if I say, Uh, 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 45 iterations. More accuracy means more trials. Okay. So if I do this 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.000001, what do you have? 51 iterations. So it always finds it. 51 iterations it always makes it go to zero because it's a very simple function. But sometimes it will exhaust all the hundred iterations. Then it should give me the error message. I've tried 100 iterations, it doesn't work. And that is the part of the last part of the function. <clears throat> if you look carefully, once it does 100 times, and if it doesn't meet that criterion in line 26, it prints the line 29, error, maximum number of iterations exceeded. Okay. At that stage, the user must come and give a different initial guess or do something to the problem. <clears throat> Any questions? Did I go too slow today? There are a lot of uninteresting faces. <laughs> okay, so let's go back and uh, I, I'll put these, uh, I mean, they, they are listed in the book, but if you want to download the functions, uh, you can download them. I'll put them on Moodle. But what I want to do is build on this idea and ask some questions about when it would fail. We have already seen a few situations where this algorithm would fail. Okay, the first situation was when the function does this, and there are two guesses that are given like this, or when the function does like this, just touches it, okay? What would it do if the function does this, okay? So you have a discontinuity. So the function is defined in such a way that there's a jump at a certain value of x. If I use this algorithm and give an initial guess here, an initial guess there, what do you think it will do? It will go towards the discontinuity, but it will give an error message because what are we testing on? We are testing on the fact that the function must be a small number, but in this case, the function is never a small number, right? If you are slightly on this side, it's a large value. If you're slightly on that side, it's a large value. It's going to approach the discontinuity from both sides, but it will never reach the discontinuity to infinite precision. So it will fail saying that it has not met the criterion. The criterion is that the function must be less than 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5, but it will go towards the discontinuity. Okay. <clears throat> Let me give you this example. So I have a function that looks like that. That is my function, a straight line. And I give an initial guess here, x1, and an initial guess there, x2 and they are not symmetrical about the root. What do you think would happen? These are the quiz type of questions. <laughs> okay. 
It will still go there. There is no problem. But it will take more than one iteration, many iterations. Okay. We are going to develop a next method which will address that problem very elegantly. Because if it is a straight line, I should be able to get it in one iteration. Because I make this guess and I can put a straight line through that and ask the question, where does the straight line intersect? The x-axis, right? So I can get that in one iteration. So there is a method called the uh, secant method, regular falsi method. Those are all used this linear interpolation idea. Once you catch on to that idea, you can say, I can now do a quadratic fit and ask a quadratic, solve a quadratic equation. So there are other methods that are built on that uh, kind of an approach and FSOL integrates some of the best ideas into this algorithm. <coughs> okay, so let's go and look at the next algorithm. Now we will start going quickly. Uh, yeah, I was going to talk about this multi-component flash because um, <coughs> we don't want to be talking about algorithms all the time. Here is a good example of a multi-component flash drum that is commonly used in gas processing plants and uh, uh, refineries. So there is a mathematical model that we can build and it is described in the book. The basic process is it's basically a vessel, a cylindrical vessel into which you pump your feed containing hydrocarbons, methane, ethane, propane, butane, etc. And you control the temperature and pressure of this flash drum. Okay, So you're flashing the feed into a liquid and a gas. So on the top you get your gas, in the bottom you get your liquid. But because you have a mixture all the way from methane, ethane, propane, they all have different boiling points. So more of the volatile material, methane, will go to the top. More of the heavy material, and butane and pentane maybe, you'll go to the bottom. So you achieve a partial separation. Now a distillation column is a multi-stage column. This is essentially a single stage column. Okay, so you can write a mass balance, you can write an energy balance, and <clears throat> that you will do in a unit operations course. For our point of view, we know already that there is something called an equilibrium relationship, which says that the vapor and liquid are in equilibrium. You have a mass balance constraint, and the mole fractions must always add up to one. Using these equations, you can reduce this model into a single equation in a single unknown. And that is our interest, because we are looking for a problem where I have single unknown and a single uh, equation. The unknown here is called psi, which is the fraction of the feed that goes to the vapor. So if you're putting 100 more pound moles per hour into the feed, if 40 pound moles goes to the vapor, then psi will be 0.4. That is what we want to find out. Okay? If I have a feed with a certain composition, so Zi is the composition of the various mixtures in the feed, methane, ethane, etc. So I know that. So if And I know the K values the equilibrium ratios. Okay, If I know them, that equation has only one unknown, and that unknown is psi. Okay, So I should be able to plot psi and see where that function is equal to zero. So a graph is given here, for example. I'm plotting f of psi against psi, and the graph looks strange. Okay, There are discontinuities here, because there is a <coughs> denominator where you have k minus 1. Okay, When uh, this value hits a certain number, the denominator can become zero. That means it goes to infinity. Okay? So if you sketch that function, the function looks like this. So it's a real problem coming from chemical processes. It looks complicated. And all we are interested in is only that root that lies between zero and one. That function can have many roots. It can have negative roots. It can have roots beyond one, but they are meaningless to us. Why? Because psi is a fraction of the feed that is in the vapor. The fraction has to be between 0 and 1. right? So that's the only physical real root. Every other roots are what we call spurious roots, irrelevant roots for the mathematical equation, but um, not, not interesting to us. So what would be a good guess for this problem? If I'm solving this, 0 and 1. right? That's how you get a good guess. One of the ways that you get a good guess is understanding the problem, formulating the problem in such a way that your unknown variable nicely scales between certain limits. So in this particular case, we have scaled it in such a way that we are interested only in finding that value of psi between 0 and 1. So a good initial guess would be uh, between 0 and 1. The way you would solve this problem is you need to write a function that will calculate this with psi as the input and f as the output. Then you can use it with bisect 
you can use it with fsol, you can use it with f0, things like that. Once you calculate your psi from fsol, for example, <laughs> then you would want to actually calculate as a process engineer what is the liquid composition, what is the vapor composition, and there are the equations there. Because once you know psi from the first equation, you plug them in there. And you know the Ki values, you know the Zi values, the feed composition. So you can get the product composition in the liquid and put that in here, you can get the product composition in the vapor. That's going to be one of the future assignments or an exam question, right? So th this is what I mean. On your own, you should look at a lot of examples in the book to be able to understand what the problem is. And if you haven't done that the first time you see it in an exam, you're going to be kind of struggling with that. So better preparation would be to go through all the examples there. <coughs> okay, so I, I, I guess I wanted to talk about it before I go to the next algorithm. This is an implementation of the flash function. What does it do? It takes psi, psi is the Greek variable, the fraction of E that is vapor, as an un unknown, and it calculates F and returns that value. So this is what I'm defining as a problem. I could use this with F sol, I could also use, with, use it with bisect. Okay? So what am I doing in this line? And why am I doing it? Remember, what is this problem? This problem has the known values. Oops. Known values are Zi and Ki. Depends on how many uh, components I have. If I have five component system, methane, ethane, propane, butane, and pentane, then Zi will have five numbers, maybe 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0.2. So we would call this an equivalent mixture. There is equal amount of every component in there. And the K values <coughs> are the equilibrium ratios that we need to get from thermodynamics. Okay, so these could be numbers like two, one point five, whatever. There should be five numbers. So this problem can actually handle any number of components, whether I have five components or twenty components. That e this equation will handle that. So what I'm doing in line in this line is declaring a global variable, where I'm going to define what k is and pass it to this particular function. Okay. Then what am I checking in this one? Can you read at the back? It's clear. I'm, I'm counting whether you're passing the same number of variables in K and in Z. Because for every component, I need a composition and I need a K value. So if they are not equal, you have done something wrong. So I print, print out an error and send it back. So I'm building these features into my the function that I'm writing. Then I'm counting how many entries are there inside. How many guesses you have provided inside. Maybe two, maybe one, maybe ten. Okay. And for each one of those guess values, I'm going to calculate what is the corresponding function value. Each one of the guess. Okay. And this is the actual function. You can see uh, element by element. If you compare this with this equation, it should be exactly the same. Now there is a summation sign. Where does the summation sign appear here? There. There is a function called sum. So that sum is going to get a vector of inputs and it's going to sum all the elements. Okay. And the, the vector of elements is simply k minus 1 dot star. It's an element by element product. Z divided by dot divide divided by the denominator. 1 plus k minus 1 times psi i. Please go through these functions and make sure that you understand that. Okay. So once that function is defined, how can I use that? <coughs> Let me go to MATLAB. Okay, so there is the function. Okay, and I need to define z and k. Okay, so I'm going to make up some problem. z is equal to 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2. Okay, and I need the k values. K values I cannot make up. If I make up, I may get unrealistic uh, results. So I need to look at um, where is the norms? Can you remember and remind, remind me as I'm typing? Oh, I have only four of them. Okay, two, one point five, point five, point one. Okay.
So k is equal to 2, 1.5, and I need to make up one more. Okay, let me make it as 0.05. <coughs> okay, so I have defined a particular feed with a particular k values, and if I want to evaluate the flash function, I can just say flash, let me do this this way, y is equal to f of ksh. Um, I want to 0 to 0.1 to 1. So I want to send 10 values of psi from 0 to 1 in steps of 0.1. Okay. All of them are 0. What, what did I do wrong? I defined k, I defined z, right? They are defined in the global workspace. Yeah? Z. I have defined Z, I have defined K in the workspace and I'm hoping to pick them up in the flash function, right? So in the flash function, if you looked, I had a global statement. <coughs> so it should pick up, the idea was that it will pick up the variables from the, if, see this is a function. Everything in this function is a local variable unless I declare it as global. So I have here declared k and z as global, but in the workspace itself, I have not declared k and z as global. Only then the workspace will share it with every function that also declares the same variable as global. <coughs> okay. So now when I declared global, global, what did it do? It reinitialized the k and z to zero in the workspace. Okay. So now I don't have the values I need to declare them again. Okay. Okay. Z. Okay. Now I try this. <coughs> okay. So these are the function values are those 10 values of psi. Do I have a root? No, there is no sign change between 0 and 1. So the function may have roots in other places, but what this means, and this is where you need to combine your process knowledge with the mathematics and with the computers, because you will get into this very often when you're doing process simulation with Aspen and Hysis. This feed mixture at those temperatures and pressures will all go to either vapor or liquid. It doesn't separate. There's no fraction that is liquid and another fraction that is vapor. If you cannot find a psi between zero and one, that is the interpretation. So my temperature and pressures have to be changed, adjusted in such a way that I get a separation. And that some temperatures and pressures control the K values. So if I change the K values, I may be able to get it. Okay, so let me change this to 0 0.9, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, something like this. Now I have, okay, I have a root somewhere between 0 0.1 and 0 0.5. So 10 or 15% of the feed will go as paper. Okay, any questions? Towards the end of this class, I felt people are kind of losing interest. I'm not sure why, um, but I think it's a long lecture. So maybe there's a place to stop. Think about it, go through these examples, and we will continue picking up these ideas um, on Tuesday with other algorithms. Okay. Thank <clears throat>